So thanks to Christoph, thanks to all the organizers uh, for putting on this uh, workshop that seems like it's going to be very interesting and uh, broad and full of different things. Uh, so what you're going to hear now is quite different to what you heard uh, earlier. Maybe I've pitched the talk a little bit more technical than I should have. So if there are questions about anything, just shout as we go. Uh, and uh, we'll take it from there. And if it's a bit too long, it doesn't matter. I'll just stop wherever I get to. Uh, so before I start, uh, thanks to various people. Uh, so uh, Jacob Dodazal, Takahiro Nomoto, and, and Jan Ketter were PhD students uh, and uh, intern uh, master students and postdoc who did some of the numerical work that you'll see. Uh, and then on the theoretical side, uh, there's been various joint papers with Julien Tailleur, uh, Fred Van Rijsdijen, uh, Etienne Fodor, uh, and Mike Cates, who's in Cambridge, obviously. Uh, and then Tal Agronov is a, a Blavatnik fellow at the moment in Cambridge who, will, who did a lot of the uh, analytical calculations that are in the middle that you'll see. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's that. Uh, you might hear his name in some other talks this week on the floor. And we've got Yariv and uh, Vivian speak about. Uh, okay, so I'm going to just give a very short motivation uh, for what I want to talk about, and hopefully the reason for all this will become clear as time goes. So what is active matter? So for us, uh, active matter is a material usually made of particles, which has energy injection at the micro scale. So you should think about your individual particles in your system or your individual agents are somehow burning energy to, for example, move around or rotate or do whatever they want to do. But that's, that's what active matter is for us. It's a, it's a non-equilibrium system where the energy injection is not driving by an external field, for example, from the outside, but rather the individual particles themselves are doing work in their environment somehow. And in this talk, active matter is going to feature as an interesting non-equilibrium system on which we can do calculations, I think. So we're going to learn something about active matter as we go, but it's not that I'm interested particularly in the flight of birds or you know, the motion of some particular self-propelled colloid. We're using this as a general framework to think about non-equilibrium phenomena. So I'll try and highlight the general features as we go. Uh, and so I guess large deviation theory is in the title of the workshop. So, so what is it for the purposes of this talk? So large deviation theory is a way of getting the properties, the probabilities, and the properties of rare events that occur in probabilistic systems, if you want. Uh, and you might ask, well, why do I care about the probability of rare events? Well, in weather forecasting, for example, you might be interested in the probability of rare events, or asteroids hitting the Earth, or something like that. That's not really the situation we're thinking about here. Um, maybe we're interested, because it's theoretically interesting, and it's an interesting theory, or maybe we're interested because large deviation theory has this deep connection to what's called optimal control theory, which says something about, if you know about rare events, maybe that can tell you how to make them happen or how to prevent them happening. And so we always think a bit about response theory when we think about large deviation theory. Okay, so with that very brief motivation, let me hop into the kind of first system that I'm gonna study, and I'll kind of draw out the general features as we go on a bit later. So there are these theoretical models which are called the active Brownian particle model. So active Brownian particles also used more broadly as a term, but this is the more specific model which theorists call active Brownian particles. So you have particles which are circles or spheres. They have positions and they have orientations. So each particle has an arrow which indicates its orientation. And they move by some sort of Langevin type equations. Uh, so the arrow is a unit vector uh, which does rotational diffusion on the circle or the sphere if you want, but here it's going to be the circle. And then the positions, they feel interparticle forces which are the gradient of the potential. They feel thermal noise, which is thermal noise. So all this so far is equilibrium-like. And then each particle swims with velocity v naught along its direction EI. And this is the particle, this is the energy injection that microscale, right? So here the particle is doing work somehow to propel itself forward. So that's why it's an active material. Uh, it swims along its unit vector, and if, if there's no obstructions, then it swims with this char characteristic velocity v naught. And then the orientations uh, diffuse, so this, this, ang this uh, unit vector is going to diffuse on the circle, and it takes this time tau to forget its direction. And then these are just uh, drawings from here. Uh, so if we're going to study this model for a little bit, we should think about what the parameters are uh, that are matter. So what matters for the parameters mm -hmm. of active Brownian particles? One parameter, so we're going to think about many of these things interacting. So one question is, how many of them do we have? What's the, basically the dimension is number density of the particles in the plane? Uh, and then the second really important parameter is how much they want to swim. So how much do the particles swim? Or how much do they self-propel? And so we're going to characterize that by considering the persistence length, which is the typical distance that a free particle swims before it forgets its orientation. If the, if the time to forget your orientation is fixed, then the persistence length is directly proportional to the swim velocity. So it's telling you something about how much injection you are, how much energy you are injecting at the microscale. 
I thought I would inject there. And then there's this one dimensionless parameter, which is uh, the persistence length divided by the diameter. And loosely speaking, if this is very small, you can think of them pretty much as passive. Um, but if it's large, then you can't. And then there are two other parameters which are important for the numeric, but not important for us. So if anybody cares, they can look. OK, so in the sort of general, so this system is going to have a non-equilibrium steady state. There is no equilibrium distribution behind this system. And in the business of non-equilibrium steady states, as many people know better than me in this room, a lot of thought has gone in to this notion of entry production. So this word informatic is sitting here for a reason which I will explain later. But let's just think about what is called in the business entry production. So these systems are injecting energy at the microscale. They have a steady state, but that steady state is not at all time reversal symmetric. And one way to, to measure how much they are not time reversal symmetric is to measure this quantity, which is called, which we're going to call the informatic entry production rate for a path. So we consider a, a path followed by all our particles, the entire system, for a time duration t. And we define the, the informatic entry production for that path as you take the log of the probability of the path divided by the probability under the same stochastic dynamic of the time reversal. So the classic example is I throw an egg at the wall and it smashes. That's a fairly likely event. But the probability of the egg reforming and coming back into my hand is a fairly unlikely event. So the entry production would be large for that. Whereas if I look at this glass of water for a while, it looks pretty much the same if I play the movie back. Sorry, you can't see my glasses. Um, so the average, so this is a per, defined for a path, but the average ent entry production rate measures the extent to which the steady state violates time reversal symmetry. Oh, th these words should not be there, sorry. They were from a different slide. So that's what it measures, the, the extent to which the steady state violates time reversal symmetry. But there are some subtleties in this definition, and I mean, not much, log and t, I guess we know what they are. Probability, we know what it is. It's the probability under the stochastic dynamics. But what do we mean by a path, and what do we mean by a time reverse path? And because of these subtleties, Mike, is, Mike Cates is the kind of person who's, I think, pushing to call this, this object the informatic entry production rate uh, because it's defined in this particular way. So let's just illustrate what are some of these subtleties. Um, so if you don't like this idea, by the way, you should just tell me, either afterwards or in a minute. Um, so let's consider some fish which are swimming. Uh, so they've got these little wake lines to indicate that they're swimming, broadly speaking, in this direction. So if we time reverse our trajectory, then the obvious thing to do is to make the fish swim backwards, to keep them in the same spatial arrangement. And this defines for me the forward path. Well, this is, this is a picture of the forward path, this is, or a snapshot from it. And this is a picture of a snapshot from the backward path. And then I can define inf informatic entry production rate as probability of this divided by probability of this. And probability of this is probably fairly low, because fish don't like to swim backwards, as far as I know. So I think they can't do it. But another thing that you might do, and is often done in models of this type, when you're defining the entry production rate, is to define the time reverse path a different way, which is to first invert the directions of all your fish, and then run the movie backwards. So this is now the forward path, and this is now the backwards path, where they're swimming along their orientation, but they're swimming in the opposite direction. And this path and this path have much more similar probabilities, actually, although you'll see that they are different in the sense that this one's got a sort of arrowhead formation, and this one's got a sort of everybody, at all the fat people at the front formation. Okay. Um, so these are two different ways that we could define uh, entry production rate, either by comparing the probability of this path with this path, or the probability of this path with this path. So when we define our time reverse path in our formula, should we reverse the orientations or not? That's the first question. And the second question is, what do we mean by a path? For example, do we record the orientations of the fish as well as their positions? Do we record the internal organs of the fish and their little hearts beating and all that stuff, all of which is happening? Um, because the, we're going to get different answers for the informatic entry production rate according to which choices we make. So whereas there is only one entry production rate, which is the amount of heat that was dissipated by this non-equilibrium system that flowed into a heat bath. So the proposal and the justification for this word informatic is that the physical entry production, delta Q over T, should be a fairly well-defined object whereas this thing has some ambiguities about it, and we have to make various choices when we define it. So it's informatic because it's just based on probability. OK, that's, that's the hard sell for the informatic entry production rate. If you don't like it, just drop the word informatic from everything I say. OK, so what is this large deviation theory that we were supposed to be talking about? Uh, so this informatic entry production rate is a random quantity. It, it's, it's a pathwise quantity. But for large times t, we have this ergodicity property 
which means that the value of the entropy reduction rate is always very close to its average value if we measure over long enough time and we have a nice little bit well behaved here. But there's still a finite probability that it takes a different value. And that's the subject of large deviation theory for, the, for me, is that uh, for large times, the probability that the entropy reduction rate that we measure has some value w is given by this formula, where it's i of w is the rate function. So probabilities can't diverge positive, uh, so this i had better be non-negative. It can be zero, in which case we've probably got the typical value of the entropy reduction, well, we have got the typical value of the entropy reduction. Um, and if i of w is positive, it tells us how unlikely is the rare value of the entropy reduction rate that we're interested in. So that's what the rate function tells you. It tells you how unlikely is a particular value. And we can also find the mechanism of the rare event. That's another interesting thing, right? First of all is how likely is it, and second is what's this mechanism? Okay, so we did this numerically. Uh, we did this numerically uh, for this active Brownian particle system. Uh, we did it twice, uh, for reasons that may or may not become clear, uh, with different groups of people. And this is an example of uh, a rate function. So the, this is the uh, value of the entry production rate scaled by the number of particles. So this is the entry production per particle. This is the rate function. Big numbers mean more unlikely or less likely. So the typical value is down here at zero. So you can, and, and I'm plotting it for different system sizes at fixed density. You can see that the, the zero of this function tells us the mean value, and it's got a sm small finite size effect in it, which you shouldn't worry about. Um, but the mean value is somewhere around about 0.45 in whatever units we're in. Uh, and you can see that the behavior is quite weird looking. So on this side, there's a very strong finite size effect. On this side, there's a much weaker finite size effect, but you can see there's maybe some sort of funny kink happening kind of here. And this was done numerically using this method called population dynamic cloning method, which Divya, among other people, worked on four phase here. Um, and what's interesting is you can look at the, what happens in the trajectories of the model over here and what happens over here. So what happens over here is that, what happens over here is that the system uh, collapses into a rather dense arrested lump in which none of the particles are moving and the very high density in the middle. And what happens over here is that the particles all spontaneously align themselves and swim in the same direction, uh, randomly chosen, through the system. So over here we have an arrested phase, over here we have a collective motion phase, and with a bit of theoretical thought, we can convince ourselves that there are actually two phase transitions in the model uh, from the typical state to the arrested state and from the typical state to the collective motion state. So this, this system is phase separated and, and arrested. So, uh, Uh, so it's like the fish swimming backwards. We look, no, we look at position and orientation, and we don't flip the orientation. Absolutely, we could, it would be, yes, we... No, it's not the same. Not the same. We can, we can take it offline. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's not at all the same, but we, we, we do. Uh, what, what matters, sorry, what I should have said was, in this model, entropy is produced by swimming. So you should think of this particle living on a, it's a think of it dry, so think of them self-propelling themselves against a frictional substrate, kind of pushing themselves along like this, and as they push themselves along, there's friction with the ground, and that's, that's what's pushing them forward. And so more self-propulsion forward means more entry produced by frictional swimming motion. That's the way we did it. Uh, you have to look at... Uh -huh. So, okay, so the reason we didn't discuss these, any of these issues in the paper is that we called it for the purpose of this paper active work, and what we defined it to be is the work done by the swim forces.
That's exactly right, sorry. But what I'm saying is in the paper, we didn't use the words entry production for this quantity. We used a different word. It is an entry production. Uh, it measures breaking of time reversal, for sure. And it has the fluctuation theorem. I didn't say it. Um, so so, so, so the, what it works out as is trajectories with high entry production rate have more swimming around, and trajectories with low entry production rate have less swimming around. And this one, you can see there's going to be more swimming around. This one, you can see there's going to be less. Uh, sorry, is there a question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, what, what's happening on the two sides is completely different. So what's happening on this side is completely separate to what's happening on this side. I mean, the, the phenomenology, the physics, everything is completely different. Yes, maybe have a little bit of patience, but yes. So, uh, yes. Uh, let me, okay, let me show the movies. Okay, there is a fluctuation theorem. That's the answer to your next question. So, oops. There is a fluctuation theorem, so everything that happens to the left of zero, we can extrapolate from this curve if we know what we're doing. So that's the first question. So here's the movies a bit bigger. So this is what happens. So in this one, they kind of swim in a particular direction by crazy, like crazy chosen at random. And here they kind of uh, um, caress each other. You can see that what's happening here is the guys on the outside are pushing everybody inwards. So here you've got a mechanism for low dissipation, which is that a few guys on the outside kind of confine everyone into a corral and then everybody in the middle just does whatever they want, but they can't dissipate because they can't move. Whereas here, it's like everyone's speaking to each other, oh, let's all go in this direction. That's a good way to suppress collision. Rep repulsive WCA potential. So a, a soft potential, but not, not particularly interesting for soft potential. Um, OK, so because those are a little bit old, I wanted to kind of say them quickly. I'm not sure if I managed. Um, so. Can we do some theoretical modeling to see similar behavior to this? Uh, and in this paper, there are some, I think, quite, well, to me, quite convincing arguments, uh, sort of theoretical arguments for what's going on with the transition to collective motion. But they are sort of of mean field type and sort of slightly hand wavy arguments. So what I'm going to show you now, quite quickly, is a theoretical calculation kind of first principles to try and address these kinds of questions. Um, so let's take a lattice model, because everybody loves a lattice model. Uh, so this is the model introduced by uh, Clément Erinu, uh, Thierry Bourdieu, Junior Teyer, and uh, Kouban Hussein uh, in this paper by Julien. So there was previous work by Clément uh, on the same or similar model. So we're going to have a square lattice, uh, either one or two dimensions, with uh, L for D sites. And I'm sorry about this, but the lattice spacing is going to be 1 over L, and the system size is going to be 1. So this is different from the first part. So this is going to be necessary. So we're going to do this hydrodynamically, this model. So the system size is going to be 1. The number of lattice sites is going to be large. It's going to be L to the D. And we're going to have a small lattice spacing. And then particles hop to adjacent sites with this rate 1 over H squared in order to have diffusion on the large scale, except that blue particles like to go to the right, so they have a slightly enhanced hop rate. And red particles like to go to the left, so they have a slightly enhanced hop rate to the left. And then additionally, adjacent particles are going to swap places with the same rate as bare hops. And this uh, helps a lot to make the model a bit solvable, actually. So. And then finally, uh, particles can change color. So red particles can turn into blue particles, and blue particles, red particles, with rate gamma, uh, which is order one. So you can see that the, 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 the transformation rate is much, 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 much smaller than the hop rate. But that's OK, because the lattice spacing is going to go to 0, and you want to make progress across the lattice in a finite time. OK, so what are the dimensions parameters for this model? There's a sort of Peclet number, which determines how much you swim, basically. And there's also a length scale, which is the effective, uh, sorry, the diffusive mean square displacement, root mean square displacement between tumbles. So a tumble is a, is a change of color. And there's a length scale, which is basically how far do I travel by diffusion before I change color. Uh, so the difference between the active Brownian particle model are quite important. We're in this hydrodynamic scaling now. So the system size is 1, and the particle size is going to 0 in the limit of large systems. Whereas before, I was keeping the particle size fixed, taking the box to infinity at fixed density. It's different. Uh, and the persistence length, moreover, here, yeah. oh, sorry, the persistence length is some rescale version of Peclet. The persistence length is order one, which means it's comparable to the system, not comparable to the particle size. So the persistence length for this, uh, you know, what would we, what would we call it? 
um, well, you know what I mean. This persistent random walk uh, length is of order of system size, and it's much, much larger than any given hop. And similarly, this diffusive distance is order one, which means of the same order as the system size, because the system size is one. Okay, so this is a big difference between this model and the ABP model, but this is the key fact which makes this model tractable analytically. Uh, so in the PDE, which will appear in a minute, there'll be a sort of diffusive term and an advective term, and it'll be the sort of ratio. Well, it's not obvious right now, but it hopefully will be obvious in a minute. <laughs> uh, hopefully. Actually, I'm not sure. Well, whatever. I think this formula might be wrong. Oh, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's, it's right. Um, Yeah, so, 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 you, so the domain size doesn't have to be one, right? The domain size could be whatever you want. But it should really be finite, I think. I mean, actually, no, you probably could make it infinite. You probably could define the model on, like, ZD embedded in RD if you wanted. I d but maybe you'd need some mathematical people to sort out existence. And I don't think, in principle, I don't think there's a problem. In practice, maybe. It's a good question. Um, yeah. So... Okay, so what happens to this model? Okay, so let's define some sort of coarse grain density of red and blue particles. We'll call them R, R, rho R and rho B. And the total density is gonna be rho, and the difference of densities is gonna be M. And then what happens to this model if you run it in a finite box? One of the things that can happen is this. It can phase separate with the right movers on the left and the left movers on the right. And this is called motility-induced phase separation, and they found it numerically in this paper. Uh, and they also derive these equations of motion uh, for the, uh, density and magnetization. Uh, and these are the sort of rigorous hydrodynamic limit for this uh, particle model. So, so this is the dynamics that it follows. And what you should think is that you define some sort of smooth density and magnetization based on your computer simulation, say. We'll call those rho hat and m hat. And then what we say is this rho hat and m hat, they follow these equations with probability one. So every time you run your simulation in a big enough box or with a small enough h, you'll see this. And then when you realize that this is a sort of convergence in probability result, then you can see that you can also analyze large deviations. You can also analyze rare paths where the system doesn't follow the hydrodynamic limit. And these have a probability which is given by an action. Uh, here's h minus one, the lattice spacing in one dimension. And this rate function is explicit. And for this, you have to read this paper by Tal and Vivian and Yariv. Maybe someone will speak about it later. Actually, well, two papers, I guess. Um, it's not quite clear what you should put here for path. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, E1 is a unit vector in the x direction. So we could maybe call it EX, right? So, so they, they, they are swimming. I've chosen that the red, blue particles swim to the right and the red particles swim to the left. So in two dimensions, I need to, I'm calling this plus E1 direction and this minus E1 direction. So it's just a unit vector. Is it okay? Sorry, in, in fact, I'm in one dimension, so I could have dropped the E1. So you could try an adiabatic decoupling if you're flipping is fast enough, and then you would get back to something like what Vivian Mike did long ago, if that's what you're thinking about. Um, but in, in general, this is, this is uh, none of this is anything that I did, right? So I'm just telling you what other people have done. It could be wrong, but I mean, I don't think it's wrong, but you should really ask them. But this is the right, these are the right equations. If you want to get rid of the M equation, you have to somehow make M fast enough, you have to make the flipping fast enough, which you could maybe do by gamma to infinity, but you don't really want to do that. Really, a two-field model. Okay. Where are we going? Okay. So, I'm going to save you. So, I'm not. Okay, sorry. I've said to you that there is this large deviation principle for paths. So, this says the probability that the system follows the non-hydrodynamic path it has some probability. In principle, we know what that probability is. The problem is that the definition of this path is, is not quite trivial. You need to follow the joint behavior of the empirical density where the particles are and the magnetization, as you know, with the red and blue particles where they are. You have to follow the current, so how much the red and blue particles are moving, 
in particular directions. And you also have to follow what I'm calling the empirical flip rate, that is, in any given spatial region, how much are the particles flipping from down to up minus how much they're flipping from down up to down. So, and then, then you can have an explicit action, an explicit rate function for this, for this problem. None of this is obvious, but it's, and it's super, super nice. Um, okay, so, so, so Tal had already done lots of these things, and he came to us and said, oh, I want to calculate the fluctuations of the, of the entry production rate in this model, and we said, great, let's do it, let's see what happens. Um, so what do we need to do to get that? So the, the average entry production rate is given by this simple formula, uh, and this is the average entry production rate, it's dependent on density. Uh, and note this entry production rate is order one, even though the number of particles in the system is going to infinity. So, so before the entry production rate was order one per particle, now it's much smaller because they're swimming much slower. Uh, and then for pars up to time t in one dimension, time tends to infinity, uh, we have um, a large deviation principle for the entry production rate. So this is pretty much what I showed before for the active Brownian particles. It's pretty much the same formula. It says that the probability to see an unusual value of the entry production rate is given by something times t times a rate function, and I've just taken this factor of L out of the rate function just for my own convenience. It's, it's not obvious, you have to, I mean, we did a calculation where we calculated the action and compared the probability of forwards and reverse paths. I think intuitively, one, one of the things that's important is that only the hops into vacant sites are biased. So these, these moves, they don't feel the swim force, only these ones. I think if they all did, it might be simpler, but for this case, you need a vacancy to hop into. Uh, uh, there's a way to get the extra factor of one minus rho squared. Uh, I did have an argument. Well, okay, at, at the hydrodynamic level, it's rather clear. You write the action, you compare the probability of the forward and reverse path. At the individual particle level, we, we did work it out, it is the same, it doesn't have to be the same, but it is the same, because at different levels of description, the entry reduction rate might be different. It is the same, and, and there's a quite complicated calculation to do with, if you're in one dimension, you can't always hop into a vacancy, you've got to get past the blue guys sometime, and that, that affects the value. So I don't have a really simple answer, I'm sorry, but that's the answer. Uh, oh. Right, so, so I was, all I was saying was uh, the probability of rare values of the entry production rate, they follow a, a, a large deviation principle with a rate function. In principle, we don't know the rate function, but can we work it out? Well, it turns out we can, because remember, for any path, in, if h is small, so as we send the lattice spacing to zero, for any path, the probability of that path is given, we already decided by this formula, so for consistency between this and this, the rate function is given by the path action or path star, where path star is the least unlikely path with the entropy reduction that we want. So you have to think about that for a moment. That's called contraction principle of large deviations. It says, if you know the probability of a whole bunch of things and you want to know the probability of a specific thing, you find the least unlikely among all the many things that achieve the specific thing, and that gives you a problem. So that, that's what this is. So if you want to know this rate function, all you have to do is find the path which is least unlikely, it minimizes the action subject to this constraint. And that is now, I told you I've got the action or someone's got the action in closed form, so this is now a sort of functional minimization problem which I'm not gonna write because it's too unpleasant. I'm just gonna show the answer. Because the answer's quite rich. Here's the answer. So this is the value of the entry production that we want. This is the density. These are some parameters which you shouldn't worry about. Oh, yes, you should worry about this one. So this was the diffusive length, and it's going to zero, because that's a, that's a particularly tractable limit. And uh, here, there is this black line. This A bar represents this black line here. It's going down here. It has this shape. Uh, oops, this function. It has this shape. And on this black line, the rate function is zero, because this is the typical value of the entry production at that value of the density. So the rate function is zero everywhere on this black line. And the system is homogeneous because we're under parameters where the steady state is homogeneous. And then there are these other phases that are popping around, so I'll just tell you what they are. So there's a homogeneous phase, which is the same phase as the black line. So it could be that the system, 
achieves unusual entry reduction by remaining homogeneous but swimming a bit more than it wants to. And that's what's happening here. If particles just swim around a bit more, that can happen with finite probability. We dissipate a bit more energy, that's all fine. Uh, okay. This PS state and this SM state, the system becomes inhomogeneous in space. The system can choose whether to become inhomogeneous in space with sharp interfaces or with a smooth density that varies as a function of space. And that's what the difference is between the blue and the, and the green. This distinction only really makes sense as L tends to zero, otherwise they're just generic and homogeneous states. Um, and then up here, we've got the collective motion state. So this is the state where everyone chooses to go in the same direction. Well, not everyone, but more than half the people choose to go in the red direction instead of the blue direction. Or, or vice versa, spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, in direction. And this TB is what we're calling traveling band. So that's basically the same as a traveling wave, but with sharp interfaces. It's like a lump of particles that just travel. Uh, so you can see it's rich. And uh, these lines for L tends to zero, they are known, in, well, maybe not quite in closed form, but as solutions to algebraic equations. So these lines are pretty much all known. Uh, you might ask about these two dots. I'm not going to say anything, but they are uh, tricritical points, it turns out. So it's quite interesting stuff happening down here as well. Um, so here are some pictures of the phases. So uh, let me just say two words about them. So this is the collective motion phase. So that's where everyone, that's where the system breaks symmetry and prefers to go in a particular direction. And the density, these are the pictures of the density. This is the density as a function of space. So the density remains homogeneous, but everybody starts traveling in one direction. This is a picture of the, of the phase separated state where you have these rather sharp interfaces with then two regions at density one and density one half. These are examples of uh, what we call spatially modulated, so inhomogeneous, but without sharp interfaces. And this is what we call the traveling band, uh, where you have this very sharp interface, which then moves with finite velocity. And so as a technical remark, these were calculated for L equals something, and these were calculated in the, in the small L limit. Remember, L is the interfacial width, basically. Uh, yeah. OK, and these CM and PS, so the collective motion phase and the, and the phase separated phase were also observed in the off-lattice models I showed you 20 minutes ago, if you remember. So this is sort of satisfactory. But if you look at this thing, what you see is if you look at low density, you've got a homogeneous state, an inhomogeneous state with low entry reduction, and a collective motion state with high entry reduction. That's exactly what we found in the off-lattice models. So that much is all consistent between the two levels of description. And then over here, there's a whole lot of more complicated stuff happening. Some sort of funny reentrance, some tricriticality, phase separated, this stuff. And this is all related, it turns out, to the, to the fact that this thing doesn't, it, this thing flips convexity at two thirds, it turns out. So there's an inflection point in this black line at some point, and that causes all hell to break loose here. Um, but if you want to understand the off lattice models, you should just look at the left part of the diagram, where everything is simple, and you have homogeneous collective motion, uh, spatially modulated for the same reason as before, which is if you want to dissipate more, you should swim around more, suppress collisions, and collective motion is a good way to do that. And if you want to dissipate less, you should block each other, and uh, in homogeneous states, you should diffuse. Um, maybe. I mean, we didn't know about this diagram when we were studying the off-lattice models. Uh, I somehow doubt it. Because um, I suspect that this, because this, this black line has to come down because at fully, at complete filling, there's no entropy reduction in this model. But in the lattice model, no, in the off-lattice model, there's no reason why it even has to come down at all. So it has to come down, and then it turns out it comes down in this non-convex way. So there's no reason that this stuff has to be generic, whereas this, I think, is quite generic. Well, it's not breaking of a continuous symmetry, but it's breaking of an Ising-like symmetry. So it's still a continuous phase transition. But I agree, there's no Goldstone mode if that's what you're worried about. I'm not. Oh. Okay, it's a good, I haven't read it. It's a good comment. Jorge, sorry.
So for current large deviations, the black line is, oh, in this model, last case year. You have no, sorry, I've forgotten the phase diagram, but, but yeah. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't say it and I should have said it. So, so Al and Vivian Yariv, as well as the paper that I showed, also discussed current large deviations. Yes. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about the last part because I have no time. Um, I just want to say one word. So I've shown you, I think, some quite interesting results for older numerical results for the off lattice model, high dynamic large deviations for the lattice model. And the calculations were quite different because in one of them I scaled the lattice facing to zero and there were these different aspects going on. Um, and then the last part was going to be, can we do the sort of hydrodynamic trick, but do it for an off-lattice model and try and make contact between off-lattice models and the microscopic fluctuation theory of Bettini and Leonardo Senio at Dundee et al. And, and the answer is yes. So the answer to this question is yes. It all works great. Um, for this system, which is a passive system with walls, where you can get a nice dynamical phase transition uh, under an appropriate large deviation calculation. Um, and you can even do more. You can even measure the stress and mechanical properties uh, of these uh, interesting symmetry broken states. Um, but in the interest of time, uh, I won't say anything about it. Um, I'll just give the conclusions instead. So, there's definitely a lot of, there's a lot going on in these large deviation phenomena for these active matter models. I think if you're an active matter person who doesn't care particularly about large deviations, maybe the thing to think about is there are these homogeneous states, there are these collective motion states, there are these phase separated states. And I think it's interesting that collective motion is a sort of mechanism for achieving low dissipation, low collisions, lots of swimming around. I think that's an interesting observation. And then the fact that you can kind of, by going gently in homogeneous, so by going to a sort of spatially modulated smooth density profile, you can also have a lot more collisions at relatively low cost and probability, so a relatively less unlikely event. Interesting. Uh, and then, as I said, I, I showed the standard off-lattice act active models, the ABPs, uh, and then there are these exact results for the active lattice gas, uh, and they have similar phenomenology of these three states, say, but they differ in the, quite a lot of the details. So a lot of what happened in those calculations was different, um, but at least we get some of the same phenomenology, and if you want to ask about the details, ask about it. Uh, and then I didn't say it, but... Uh, oh, I didn't say this either. Okay, ask me in coffee break if you want to know about the answer to this question, uh, about what, what we mean by a hydrodynamic mechanism and a non-hydrodynamic mechanism, because I think it is out there in the literature. I think lots of people understand it, um, but it only recently became clear to me. So if you understand it well, explain it to me, and if you don't, ask me. Yeah. Great, thanks. thanks for listening. I'll stop. <laughs>